Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Dr. Arwen Podesta. Uh, she's a board-certified adult psychiatrist with subspecializations in addiction medicine, forensic psychiatry, and integrative medicine. So we're going to talk about her work. So Arwen, thanks for coming. Pleasure to be here. Nice to see you. Yeah. So what is, um, first of all, what is forensic psychiatry? Good question. Uh, A lot of people ask that. So forensic meaning anything having to do with the law, psychiatry being my specialty in medicine. So psychiatry is subspecialization in uh, medicine after medical school or a specialization. So after you complete your friends, you, after you complete your psychiatric residency, you have the option of going into a whole slew of specialization training. And one of them is forensic psychiatry. Forensic psychiatrists um, do one year of training in that extra subspecialized field. And we basically work with anybody who our clients or our consults are having to do with anything related to someone in a legal situation, whether it's criminal or civil, plus something in a mental health issue. So my role there is I tend to work in consultant drug courts, which have both legal and uh, psychiatric or substance issues, consult with other sorts of court situations. In a criminal court, you would see forensic psychiatrists mostly determining or or interviewing people and making recommendations on whether someone was sane at the time of the crime or not sane during the time of the crime or whether they have capacity to stand trial and if they don't make recommendations on what might be helpful in the civil sure. setting. It's interesting. I think probably the only experience people have is you know, maybe watching TV where someone in court says, you know, I plead innocent because of mental insanity or something, you know, that's right, probably right. the extent of what yeah. most people know. But what, what are some of the interesting nuances that you found about, you know, being in court and dealing with mental illness? Yeah, well, part of it also has to do with their civil cases that are really interesting having to do with things like my specialty, of course, uh, we'll get to that is is an opioid addiction, opioid misuse. And so there's a lot of legal action going on right now related to overdoses, not prescribing certain things or over prescribing certain things. And so those are cases that I'm really intimately involved with right now. But in this criminal setting, I've had some wild cases where I've had to interview psychopaths and, you know, have the hair stand up on the back of my neck and know that they were truly evil people in front of me. And then, and not necessarily their crime was not necessarily stemming from their addiction or their psychiatric illness. It was bad. So my favorite kind of way of breaking it down is some people do a crime and it's because they're bad or it stems from badness. Some people do a crime and it's sometimes because they're mad or, you know, insane in some cases. Sometimes there's overlap where people are both mad and mad and bad. 
but the specialty gives us tools to understand where the crime has come from, whether it's a, from a stemming from a mental illness or stemming from a truly evil intent. Yeah, I knew an attorney that, uh, you know, when he was when he first started, he interviewed um, Charles Manson. Charles Manson was asking for a pencil or something. And, you know, he, he brought some pencils to give to him. And then the, the more senior attorney said, do not do that. He could kill you with a pencil pretty quickly. So this attorney that I knew, he had to interview him and he said he was like quaking. It was, you know, obviously Manson is very famous, but also very sick. Right. So it was just an interesting experience for him, you know? Yeah. And that sort of, you know, kind of that silence of the lambs experience, right? Like it's very, it's, it's very critical that the experts from the attorneys, but also the psychologists and forensic psychiatrists, that they really have their head on to make sure that they're not able to be duped or manipulated because that is, you know, what sometimes the criminal goal is, whether it's stemming from badness or madness. I don't do much of the criminal at this moment in my career. I really do a clinical practice and psychiatry and wellness. And also I work in addiction a lot. And then I also do civil cases that are more in line with like opioid, uh, opioid prescriptions and opioid addiction. I like what you said. Does it come from badness or madness? It's funny. Yeah. I was taught that in my forensic fellowship, my forensic psychiatry fellowship. And I just thought that was so great. You know, there's a Venn diagram and there's certainly an overlap between the two, but which, and, and, you know, some people have both, but really the question is where does the actual incident stem from? And that's, there's a nuance, there's an art and a science to understanding that as an expert. Well, it's funny, as a psychiatrist, you deal with badness, madness, sadness, gladness, a bunch of messes, I guess. Yeah, right? I like that. I like the, uh, let's aim towards gladness and wellness. All right. So what part of your practice really, I don't know, it just, it fascinates you because it's just unusual or challenging or difficult. You know, which area do you really enjoy the most and why? Yeah, I love, I really like the more nuanced. Uh, so I had a genetics background. And even before that, before medical school and before genetics, and um, I was a practicing massage therapist. I, I trained for a year and got certified and had a really great practice. And so being able to merge the brain, body, mind, and whole macro environment, I think is the most inspiring thing to me right now. And so I really have a goal to bring wellness, you know, with dignity and have access to good wellness and good treatment to any sort of person that wants to improve their life from cognitive enhancement to, you know, decreasing anxieties to improved mood, decrease dependence on different sorts of drugs, even decrease dependence sometimes on different sorts of medications, if that's possible. And I find the most satisfaction when I bring someone from really a state of of misery and concern using lots and lots of different tools and sometimes many years of work and not just me, multiple, multiple people in my treatment team and multiple tools in the toolbox into wellness. And, you know, I get great feedback from patients that not only there are they, did they meet their goals that we set forth to, let's say, you know, improve their sleep, improve their mood, and also to decrease their dependence on drugs or alcohol. Not only did we accomplish those goals, but we also accomplished something beyond where they feel they're thriving. And so I would love to see all of my patients thrive. It does take work. And I do lean on a lot of other team members to help the cause because it, it is a complicated, complicated process. Well, what are some of the, uh, you know, the, the disabilities or problems people have, you know, psychologically that you help them with and how do you help them? Any specifics? I know yeah. each person's situation is different, but it's so you know. different. But you know, with with the pandemic, I think that the highest I've seen more sessions and anxieties and things that are like germophobia and severe anxieties and sleeplessness really come true. It's been worse in more severe and uh, patients have had more problems and with or without addiction. And so, you know, I do both addiction medicine and psychiatry and wellness, but the crossover is so profound right now. So I see it just a lot of panic attacks, a lot of anxiety, a lot of anxiety about going back to work, about not having work, you know, and anxiety is good, you know, having a little bit of anxiety so that you're using you know, you're avoiding bad situations, like you're not going to run across a highway, you're going to 
to, you know, avoid that because you have like some sound anxiety in your brain. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. But when it overtakes and makes it so that you're not able to go to work, not able to maintain friendships, not able to sleep, then we really worry. And it's a, usually a downward spiral until it's an upward spiral. So anxiety, sleeplessness, those are the main things. And in conjunction with or without ex- excess alcohol and drug use, it's pretty big right now. Some so of where have you big- noticed uh, anxiety comes from and people, you know, I obviously, you know, during COVID, it's it's different, I guess, from before. But what do you notice? What are the common reasons that people get anxiety and how does it manifest? Well, you know, first, there's a, almost a biological stemming from it. So from childhood and genetic biological background, people, you know, I uncover that people may have had fear and anxiousness, maybe from trauma as children, or maybe from, you know, nutrition, malnutrition as children, or maybe from just general fear of the world, depending on what was going on. And then that, that might be episodic during childhood, but then when stress comes out, when stressful events happen, then people resurge into these problematic thought processes. It kind of goes back to that, back to those laid out pathways that were from before. And it's not limited to that because certainly being in a fearful situation, no matter what you're childhood background was can lead anyone to to have anxious thoughts and to face a lot of anxieties. On top of that, sleep, if we don't sleep well, then we don't recover our brains. And so then we end up having anxious days or depressed days or some some irritability or whatever the phenomena is or the um, outcome is. And we're sitting in front of screens more, we're breathing less, we're actually usually in a state of almost breathing too fast and too much because of like the requirements of us and we're just going and going. And so all of those is kind of the perfect psychological pie to get us into a society that is pretty anxious overall. And I'm seeing it more and more. So what are some of the treatments for anxiety? Is it all drug-based or are there other therapies like CBT that you employ? Yeah. So, uh, you know, CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy, and it's one of many types of psychotherapy that's algorithmic algorithmic with some basic tenets that's um, really reproducible and has great, great, great results. And, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is when you do a a study between that and just an antidepressant that's indicated for anxiety, such as escitalopram or duloxetine, those sorts of uh, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. The CBT has similar efficacy, takes a little longer, but similar efficacy and of course fewer side effects. And so I love implementing non-medication therapies. I use a lot of supplemental therapies as well. I do use medication. I, you know, prescribe serotonin reuptake inhibitors. I try to not need to prescribe benzodiazepines, but sometimes if someone is in an acute panic moment, that really is the only thing that works. We just know that there are some perils and risks with getting people onto benzodiazepines for like Xanax and Valium and Clonopin. Getting people onto those for long term is risky, but for in the short term, fewer than two or three weeks while they're getting into therapy, while they're changing some other habits, maybe doing some mindfulness meditation. Um, maybe starting a serotonin reuptake inhibitor or something similar. I work with non-pharmaceuticals, as I mentioned, and that includes supplements and devices as well. So there are some ear stimulating devices that send a pulse. And if you use, it's one that I use is called alpha stim. And if you use that every day, it can really change your sleep habits. It can help with sleep tremendously, and it can also improve your anxiety profile. And so what do you mean? What is, what is alpha stim? 
If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. So yeah, so um, Alpha Stem is, um, it's an electric device that I'm, I'm wondering if I can grab a, a visual for you too, because it's actually really cool. Well, it's all right. You can, you know, we'll just yeah. do audio, but you could, you could describe it. And how sure, it works sure, and what sure, it does. sure. Yeah. So, um, so Alpha Stem is basically electro stimulating device that, that plugs into um, a pulsing, there's a pulsing electric device that has wires on it. And those elect, those wires hook onto your ears to send signals in your brain, in your brain, through your ears to both excite certain pathways and inhibit other pathways. And so by using it on a daily basis for a couple of weeks, it show it kind of changes the way that those excitatory and inhibitory in, uh, brain pathways are. And so it changes it and it helps the overall anxiety profile without medication. It's very impressive. Um, and it's in the category of neurostimulation devices or cranio electrotherapy stimulation devices. It also so has- it's not it's not shock therapy, but it's it's stim not essentially, at all. right? Right. And so, you know, it, the shock therapy is uh, needs to be conducted in a hospital setting, usually you're in some sort of like um, clinical setting and by a specialist. Um, this would not have anything similar to that. It doesn't shock. You don't have to go under. It's not amnesia or, um, causing, but it's uh, very effective for anxiety, for some sleep issues, for depression, for pain even. Is this like transcranial magnetic stimulation or is that? So that about? is, that is um, also transcranial magnetic stimulation. TMS is something that is performed also in an office setting. This is, this is something that's lighter that one can take home. That's, and it's a different TMS is a very different mechanism, but it's kind of in the same category of disrupting these inhibitory and excitatory pathways so that they retrain themselves to be in a more effective and less anxiety provoking state. So, uh, okay. What is the person experience when they use this stim machine? Do they feel anything? Do they, are they supposed to like sit quietly and close their eyes for 15 minutes or like, how does it work? Yeah. So when you use this and it is prescribed, it's a prescription that, that someone would need to acquire in order to access this. In my office, we rent them out to our patients and then oftentimes patients will like it so much they'll buy it. And so really when you get up to a certain Hertz, it, turn it up to a certain Hertz and you'll start feeling a little bit of vertigo, vertigo or seasickness. And then at that level, you know that you're at the right place. So turn it down just a teeny bit. So it's not really irritating. And I have people that do it while they're having their morning tea and checking email. It's a 20 to 40 minute daily exercise and you can do it. You can do it with meditation. You can do it with, you know, reading the paper. You can do it while lying down, not driving, please. But the otherwise it's, um, it's very safe and easy to use with just very little noticeable effect of the active phase, except for that little bit of feeling of seasickness. Do you, do you try it? Have you tried it? What did you experience? Yourself? Yeah. What's up? Well, this is so great. Um, what I love about what I do, because I do a lot of holistic integrative medicine for a lot of patients. Um, I'm trained in it. And so I do a lot of things, like I said, that are supplemental supplements, botanicals, non-pharmaceuticals, and also devices such as this. And so absolutely. I'm going to try it. I'm going to have my staff try it. We're going to learn about it so we can talk about it, you know, so we can really uh, demystify the fears also that patients may have about it. What's what's the device called, by the way? Like, or what's the therapy called? So it's under the category of cranial electrotherapy stimulation. Um, the, there are FDA approved devices, and I just pulled up a list of them because I want to make sure I don't miss any because I'm not shilling for one or the other. Um, I happen to use the device that's called the Alpha Stim, and there are several others that are FDA cleared um, and available by prescription, by prescription, such as the Fisher-Wallace stimulator, the CES Ultra made by NeuroFitness, um, one called Capturon Mind Gear, that's C-A-P, I'm sorry, Caputron, C-A-P-U-T-R-O-N, Mind Gear, and another called NeuroCare Micro. So those are FDA 
cleared, FDA, you know, studied with good evidence of, um, of outcomes for um, alpha stim or other cranioelectral devices versus medications. And they have superior outcomes, just like CBT has, you know, has equal outcomes with fewer side effects, um, but it takes longer. This has superior outcomes with fewer side effects to medications. Well, have you observed people using it or again yourself like what have they experienced that you've seen or what have you experienced using it if you have i tried it really to see what the side effects would be so i could dispel the myth of you know what the fears are and i didn't use it for more than 10 days and it's really a 30 day to see what the changes can to see how the changes come out i've had several people get off of benzodiazepines by just using this device i've had several people decrease their doses of different medications that were causing side effects. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't like to have a medicine with a side effect and then give another medicine for it. So whenever we run into that, I try and think outside the box and give something that doesn't cause a side effect or that may, may take away the medicine that is causing the side effect. So I've also had some folks that just had this unrelenting anxiety for years and years and years and were not wanting to take medicines. And so gotten them through to at least a tolerable level of anxiety with you, this device just for 30 or 60 days. And if people find out about this, because I, I know a few people that have, you know, gone to therapy and you know taken SSRIs, but it seems like that's what's suggested right off the bat by most psychologists, psychiatrists. I mean, yeah. how do you break through to this next level of, you know, TMS and this, you know, the treatment you're describing, the alpha stim and the alternative ones? Like, what should people look for so they don't just have a regular practitioner that says, oh, here's some SSRIs, bye. Right. Well, there are those that practice in the integrative and functional medicine fields. Um, some of us know about these sorts of things. Not everybody does. Those that practice traditional psychiatry and are trained in traditional settings and don't reach out to look for alternative uh, types of treatment, they're going to be, you know, traditionalists, they're going to prescribe what we were taught to prescribe, you know, it, we're, we have anxiety, we're going to treat with an anti anxiety, which is a benzodiazepine or a serotonin reuptake agent, you know, there's, we have pain, we're going to treat with a pain pill, which is a, an opiate, right? So that's what we're taught in medicine. And we're doing more in medical schools and in residencies to do more integrative treatments, but the practitioner really has to look for it themselves. What I know is that on these, if you go to these FDA cleared devices that I mentioned, Alpha Stim, Fisher Wallace, CES, Capturon, and NeuroCare, if you go to any of their websites, they will have like patient inquiry so that you can look for someone in your area that is prescribing it because those are listed, but it is hard to find. I do recommend if someone's interested in not working solely with, with a traditional psychiatrist for medication management, if you want to go beyond that or go further or deeper, trying to find someone that uses functional medicine or is trained in integrative psychiatry that maybe has, I have a nutritionist in my office and a couple psychotherapists and an acupuncturist. And so trying to work with people that have that mindset, but it is not traditional and it is not fully taught at every location. And so I'm, 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 I'm teaching. I do. I, I teach at uh, multiple, multiple um, conferences and I teach in two different residencies, psychiatry residencies, this sort of thing. The doctors, the new doctors are hungry to learn about it. It's just not in the medical literature in a way that is robust to get into medical school yet. So is there such a thing as a functional psychiatrist, yeah. functional medicine psychologist? So kind of. So anybody with any, um, any MD or DO or nurse practitioner, there's functional medicine training. And so functional medicine is really getting to root cause. So oftentimes anxiety is not caused by an anxiety provoking situation that could be the man that could be the thing that broke the camel's back right that made it so it's pathological a lot of times you know there's you've done you've done a lot of research on the gut brain axis and so knowing that your microbiota in your gut might affect how your brain is responding and how many chemicals that are calming versus excitatory your brain is making and so working with people that understand some functional medicine and some root cause is really helpful. There is psychiatry, there, 
so any medical practitioner can be trained in functional medicine and certain nutritionists and homeopaths and naturopaths. Unfortunately, we don't always overlap with psychiatry. So there's just a handful. There's a couple of fellowships, an integrative psychiatry fellowship that you can see on, I believe their website is just integrative psychiatry. And then there's something called psychiatry redefined where I'm involved with that group and they're retraining psychiatrists in a subspecialty fashion. The way I did forensic, they're doing it as a fellowship, um, a non-accredited fellowship, a voluntary fellowship. So folks can learn exactly this sort of stuff that I'm talking about. What are some of the other treatments that uh, seem to be very promising to you that may not be widely widely known? I use a lot of supplements, like I mentioned. Um, I put most people, depending on their gut history, I put most people on just a mild probiotic just in case their gut bacteria need to be rebalanced. And it also helps with your GI anyway. So it's not harmful for most. Some people get a little bloated and so retract that. I put most people for with anxiety on a decent amount of magnesium. There's a couple of different magnesiums. The one that is the, in my experience, the most balanced to get to the brain part of the anxiety and the heart palpitation and the flushing that some people get with anxiety and also not make you have too loose of bowels because that's something magnesium types do is magnesium glycinate, G-L-Y-C-I-N-A-T-E. So magnesium glycinate is very tolerated, very easy to find. Magnesium, you'll see it in supplements that you'll find at, at vitamin shops that are called like MagCalm and, you know, Calm combination or magnesium ease or stress magnesium. So magnesium, that's key. And acetylcysteine is also helpful for anxiety and certain like obsessiveness as well. And then there is a product called Silaxan that's over the counter, S-I-L-E-X-A-N. There's a brand called Lavella, L-A-V-E-L-A. It's a lavender oil extract. And so if you've done any studying on kind of the newer phenomena of terpenes, which are not just THC oil or not just marijuana oil extracts, but also all sorts of plant oil extracts, Silaxan or Lavella is a a whole plant extract of lavender. And it's very, very powerful. It's effective. It's over the counter. It has not shown to have any side effects that I've noted in all the patients I have taking it, except for a lavender flavored burp, which people love or hate. Yes. And it's not limited to those, but those are kind of my mainstay for starters. I don't know. What would you guess is the uh, the percentage of patients that most psychiatrists are able to help will it help a higher percentage of people? I mean, I hope so. My data looks good and I, I don't unfortunately do as rigorous of data collection as I tout that one should just because I am clinically minded. I am seeing the patients in front of me. And so we do encourage people to do some pre and post testing to help understand the data. When you use precision medicine, you have a higher efficacy. When we do tests on antidepressants to anyone that meets the criteria for depression, the effect efficacy rate is under 50%. In fact, oftentimes it's close to 30 to 40%, sometimes even less and even less will get FDA approved because depression is such an awful disease. So, but when we analogy, I like to make is, you know, in psychiatry, we don't we don't have a brain bacteria that we culture. In infectious disease, if you're looking at a bacteria, you put a bacteria on a plate, culture it, and find out what exact the root cause is, and then treat it, use an antibiotic to ad- address that exact root cause, you know, to, to kill that exact bacteria. We don't do, we don't do a brain biopsy. We don't do a whole bunch of things that would give us some sort of precision. So the clinical interview, what I teach my students and residents is to be able to have a very clear clinical interview. And that's actually what functional medicine training is too, is getting a good workup to understand, at least be closer to what the root cause is. So when I'm asking people about their history, I'm asking about their childhood, but not just their you know possibility of abuse, but also how many times did they have the flu or cold or were they exposed to certain toxins? Were they taking antibiotics throughout their childhood? Things like that. So yes, I think that using precision medicine is going to give you a better outcome. I don't have wholly 100% great outcomes, but I do know that when we use multiple tools in the toolbox and we get a really good history, we have better outcomes overall. Yeah, it makes sense. Do you see any new therapies coming in the next couple of years that are going to be breakthrough in your opinion or? 
is there anything you're waiting for or is it just kind of, you know, keep yeah. going? Well, I'm excited about, you know, anything to improve patient outcomes because in addiction, when I see a poor patient outcome, it's an overdose which could lead to mortality or morbidity. So anything to improve patient outcomes. In addiction, I'm very excited that there's a whole bunch of, of novel therapeutics that are in the pipeline, some of them with using amino acids, some of them using virtual reality, other devices, like I mentioned, like the alpha stim, but even more other wearable devices or other other things that would be beneficial for, this is not just for the opioid crisis, but for addiction and the reward cycle in general. Interesting in addiction is the opioid vaccine. We're looking at that as a possibility. There's a bunch of initiatives through the National Institute of Health that are, that are going to, that are going forward with really great researchers putting together different ideas for immunological therapies for a vaccine. Digital therapeutics is key. We have cognitive behavioral therapy is great when you do it in the office with the, with the uh, therapist and then you do your homework at home. But what happens when you wake up at 4 a.m. and your mind is cycling and your anxiety is swelling? Uh, swelling? What happens then having something digital to help you through that or help augment the therapy? So there's a whole bunch of new therapies that are actually FDA approved digital therapeutics to help with cognitive cognitive behavioral therapy, help with insomnia. And those are prescribed apps, in fact, covered by most insurances, most private insurances. And other things like that, coordination of care platforms, I'm really big on that right now because what I find is the worst outcomes are when someone leaves one setting, whether it's a hospital for for a suicide attempt and then has to go outpatient, they don't coordinate care or they attempt to, but it doesn't go through and then there's a bad outcome or coming from an addiction facility and then leaving and then going into an outpatient setting and care is coordinated, but it falls through and there's no follow-up. So those are all things that I'm really keen on and there's lots of stuff in the pipeline. There's lots of stuff that's newly available in those realms. I don't, I don't understand. Why would you need an opioid vaccine? What, what would well, that do? Yeah. So thanks for asking that. I think that's interesting. So the thing about opioids is, you know, we're, we're seeing overdoses and deaths on opioids all the time. And so if you had a, a vaccine that basically blocked the ability for someone to overdose or blocked the ability for someone to get loaded and then continue to seek, and I say loaded, I get high, continue to seek the high. If you're blocking that ability and you can definitely save lives. So that's part of it. And part of it is also to prevent those that have such a genetic preponderance for, let's say both parents had opioid addiction, one because of a genetic, there's lots of genes related to the risk for addiction. And so let's say someone has stuff on both sides, they're very, very at risk. They are starting to dabble in opioids and both of their parents had already overdosed and died of opioids. So there's adding a vaccine to the possibility of therapeutics is a really great tool. But why would it be called a vaccine if it's a man-made substance that people are taking that addicts them and, you know, causes all these problems? I mean, why wouldn't they call it a, a I don't know, something else instead of a, it, oh, it's just I weird. Mean, it doesn't sound like a vaccine to me. It's not like a, a virus or a bacteria or something that infects me unwittingly. Right. And so a vaccine isn't necessarily like the vaccine isn't about the vector that's infecting. It's about the, the, the thing that's going in the system. So the vaccine is the, what your doctor gives you. And it can be against a whole bunch of different entities. It can be against a virus. It can be against an amoeba, bacteria, slew of things. And in this case, a drug. And so vaccine is made in, an, in giving your body immune antibodies to the thing, as opposed to where right now we have, let's say, medication assisted treatment that blocks the opioid receptor from receiving the opioid or from from having an effect with the opioid. So let's say naltrexone, the anti-opioid. However, the opioid vaccine is such that the person gets an injection with something that makes the body make antibodies. The immune cells ramp up antibodies to, let's say, fentanyl in particular. And then when the person takes that fentanyl, the antibodies, just like our antibodies when we're vaccinated for COVID, our antibodies go, when we do get exposed, our antibodies go and attack the virus. In this case, we've got antibodies made to go and attack fentanyl. So biggest phenomena for my patients and what I see right now is those that are using 
cocaine or methamphetamine, it they're coming back positive for fentanyl in their system. They're not trying to use fentanyl, but they're, you know, sometimes overdosing and definitely coming back positive for fentanyl in their system. So if we can combat that in some sort of way, then we can at least save lives. So that's why there's the initiative with 98,000 people dying in a year of this disease of opioid addiction. You know, they're really trying to help prevent the deaths and the addiction in particular. Yeah. Okay. That's crazy. What, what's the best way for people to reach you to find out more about your practice? Where do they go? Yeah. So my website is podestawellness.com, P-O-D-E-S-T-A wellness.com. And um, we have a small practice in New Orleans. And then I also am teaching at different conferences. I, I will be speaking at um, Integrative Medicine for Mental Health and just a at the end of the month, um, I'll be speaking at Psych Congress National Meeting, which is going to be in late October. And I have some other upcoming talks on addiction in the Louisiana area for the Louisiana chapter of American Society of Addiction Medicine in October. And so all of that can be found out at, just by going to my website and going to the Ask for Info. All right. Very good. Arwen, thank you for coming on the podcast. I yeah. appreciate it. Uh, Great to see you, and thank you for being interested in these subjects. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.